Lekuti Sichais, Chelikud Gimel, Volume 13, Second Sicha for Parshas Pinchas. This is again a Rashi Sicha, and we're going to try to learn as much as possible inside, part of Chapter 1 and Chapter 4, and of course discuss as best as we can and get a good picture of the Sicha. I think in this Sicha, besides reacquainting ourselves with the rules of Rashi, but uh, I think most, most specifically, we're going to find out that when Rashi gives a mushal, Rashi gives a parable, a metaphor, Rashi refers to a medrash from which he gleaned this metaphor, it is so absolutely accurate, the way he presents it, and the words he chooses to quote, and the words he chooses not to quote, that it really sheds light and you can really connect it to every single detail and every single profound insight into what the Pasuk is telling us. Let's jump right into it. So this Rashi is on the Pasuk of Tzavos B'nai Yisrael that Hashem tells Moshe, command the Yidin to offer the Karbonis, right? The Karbonis Tamit. And this is the, what's called Parshas HaKarbonis in Parshas Pinchas, the Parsha of all the Karbonis. In fact, we read it on special occasions like Rish Chodesh, Yom Im Toivim, and so on. Now, when did this happen? What is the Parsha that precedes this? The Parsha in which Moshe Rabbeinu, realizing that it's almost the end, remember it's the end of the 40 years, Hashem already had directed him in this Parsha, to allocate the land to the B'nai Tzlavchot, to the daughters of Tzlavchot. Everything is basically done, ready to hand over the reins to Yehoshua, and the Yidna are going to go into Eretz Yisrael, and Moshe is going to remain here. What does Moshe do? He says, Yifkoit HaShem Elokei Arucha HaShem should appoint a leader that should take the Yidna into Eretz Yisrael, that should look after them, and so on. Of course, Yehoshua was hoping that his sons will take over, and Hashem directs him and says, Yehoshua. And then comes this parsha. So this is the background, so we have a better appreciation, a better understanding of this Rashi. Let's look inside. B'tchilas parsha sa'kabonis, b'parsha seinu, in the beginning of the parsha of the kabonis in our parsha, ma'itik Rashi is ha'tevois, tzav es b'nei Yisrael, Rashi quotes the words, tzav es b'nei Yisrael, command the Yidun, u'mefadish, and he explains, Ma Omor Lamaila, what is said above? Yivkoit Hashem. Hashem should appoint, Hashem should command a leader. Amalei Kodish Baruchu. So Hashem said to him, to Moshe, Achatam Itzaveni Al Bonai. Until, meaning, before you are telling me, you commanding me about, directing me about my children, Tzabez Bonai Alai. You command, you direct my children about me. Moshal. Chulu. And then Rashi brings a mushal, which he's quoting from the Sifri, a mushal of a princess, a daughter of a king, who's about to die, and she's talking to her husband and telling him about her children. And her husband turns around and says, why don't you tell my children about me? Ukidla kamon sifbeis, as we're going to go into detail more in the second chapter. So the Rebbe asks, Vov tzadik lamed hei beis, this Rashi Tevis is acronym, Vitzarich lehovin. We need to understand. What is difficult to Rashi? What was Rashi's question in the word Sav is B'nai Yisrael, command the Yidin, that this pushed Rashi, this necessitated Rashi to explain what it is? If one is going to argue that it's because of the word Sav, Rashi already had explained it in the beginning of Parsha Tzav, Uvahad Gosha, and Rashi emphasizes there, Ein Tzav Eloloshin Zirus, that Tzav is not but Eloshin, an expression of Zirus, which means urging, encouraging. Miyad, for the immediate, for, the, for, the, for, the, for that um, juncture, for that time, Uledoides, and for future generations. Hainu, which means, that in any place that it says the word tzav, ain pirush achel tzav. There is no other meaning for the word tzav. Let me explain this paragraph. The rule in Rashi is number one that whenever Rashi explains something, 
that means that there was a difficulty with it. Rashi doesn't just come here to give us extra information or to bother us. If it makes sense, then you just move on. That's what Pshuta Yisha Mikra means. Obviously, when Rashi addresses it, that means there's something that needs to be addressed. What needs to be addressed here? What is so difficult with the word tzav? Tzav means command. Hashem is telling him to do it. That's what Moshe has been doing all along. And if you argue that somehow this expression is somewhat not, you know, the norm, not the, that the usual, or it seems to be, you know, telling us something, Rashi already took care of that long ago in the previous Chumash, in Parshas Tzav, and there not only he explains it, but Rashi makes an emphasis to tell us that this is the only thing it can mean. It cannot mean anything else but this for the immediate time and for future generations, meaning this is always what it means. It's always a lushing, an expression of encouragement, of urging. Make sure this is done. So that can obviously not be the reason that prompted Rashi to explain this. What then is it? Yesh mefarshim, there are those mefarshim that explain, the Rashi bo levayr hasmichus de parsha zu le parsha kodem es yifkod Hashem. That they explain that really the issue is not with the word tzav, the issue is not with the word tzav per se, rather the whole topic, the whole idea of the Korban is coming in now, right after Bismichus, adjacent to the Parsha which we had just learned, namely the story in which Moshe Rabbeinu asks or tells Hashem to appoint a leader on the Jewish people, and this is the reason that prompted Rashi to say it, and Vizui Kavanes Rashi, and this is Rashi's intent, the Masha Kosov, and what he says, Ma, quote, Ma Omer Lamaila Yifkad Hashem, that Rashi says, what does it say above, meaning above, meaning the immediate preceding Parsha, which we had just learned, Kilayma, meaning to say, Ma Wakesha Bein Parsha Seinu La Omer Lamaila Yifkad Hashem, in other words, Rashi really his objective is to explain what is the connection between this parsha, the parsha of the Karbanis, and the parsha which just previously, just now, been learned. And therefore, Metaritz Amalek Kadosh Baruch Hu. And that's why Rashi explains and he answers why did they come together? Because Hashem said to him, "Before you tell me about my children, tell my children about me." That's what some of Rashi explain. Now let's go because it's just very long. We'll do it more outside. This question, the question obviously is not fully answered. And the Rebbe explains why. There are certain rules in Rashi which cannot allow us to just accept this answer and just move on. Why? Because there's a certain pattern. There's a certain pattern that Rashi always follows when he does this type of explanation, explaining why two parashas came together in the Torah, why Hashem chose to put them adjacently in the Torah. And typically Rashi would say the expression, Lama nismacha parsha zu le parsha zu. Why was this parsha put near this parsha? Or why was this said near that? Rashi doesn't do that here. Rashi does not do that here. All he does is he quotes the word sav, and he explains it and he goes into this. So this cannot be the reason, because if this was the reason, he would follow the typical protocol that he himself has set out by means of what he had done in the past, by the precedent, several times the way he presents such a type of question. So obviously this is not his main question, or this is not his question at all that prompted him to explain this Rashi. That's number one. Number two, this wouldn't even be a question. In other words, this cannot be the question. Not only it doesn't seem to be the question, because this is not following the pattern of Rashi, but this cannot be a question. Because what's the matter? Why does it say you're here? I'll tell you why it says you're here. And I explained it in the, the introduction already. We're about at the end of 40 years. Almost any day now, Moshe knows that it's time for him to pass away, and it's time for the Eden to go into Eretz Yisrael. So it's obvious that if Hashem wants to direct them how to do the offerings, the daily offerings and the Yom Tov offerings and so on, and it has not yet been discussed in detail, this is the time. So why does it say it here? Because there's nowhere else to say it. If it hadn't been said by now, it's got to be said now because tomorrow isn't the time. It's, it's too late. Tomorrow meaning in another few days, it's going to be too late. So the reason why it's Samuch, the reason why they came adjacent, why they came close to each other, because there's no other choice. Now, 
Another suggestion maybe could be, ooh, it says, Tzavez B'nai Yisrael V'yomarta Aleyhem. Command the Jewish people and say to them. And perhaps, and there's a suggestion as such, that maybe that's what prompted Rashi to do to explain something here. Why? Because perhaps there's a double expression. Command and say. Right? It's a double expression. So maybe that's what prompted Rashi to, you know, explain this, what the tzav over here means. But that cannot be the question. Because Rashi doesn't put it in the heading. Remember, whatever Rashi is out to explain, whatever Rashi really, whatever, I'm sorry, whatever really prompts Rashi to explain, whatever he explains, meaning that's the question, will be included in the Dibur Hamaschil, in the heading. And in this case, all it just says is, Tzav is B'nai Yisrael, command the B'nai Yisrael. It doesn't say, dat 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 via Marta Aleyhem. So that obviously cannot be what prompted Rashi to explain this. That cannot be the question. And besides, the Rebbe says, many times we find that we find this expression, Tzav and Viomarta, command and say. And it always is obvious, or it's even explained, that in those places Hashem says it in such a way, in such a manner, in order to emphasize it, to underscore it, to, to give us the, uh, a sense of the importance of it, the weight of it, and therefore he says, Sav v'amartalem. To use an example, I mean, today, if you're using a computer, you want to write something, you want to bold something, all you have to do is click a button. But in yesteryear, when you use a typewriter, a regular typewriter, what you would do is, you would go back and type over the letters to make it an emphasis. You do it double. You would you would do it. You would emphasize it by putting in extra ink, an extra clap with the with the typewriter gave it that emphasis. So tzav via Marta, command and say is just a means of emphasis of, of really making it you know a, a, an important thing. This must be done. So that cannot be that cannot be the question. Okay. Now we're in chapter two. Now in chapter two, before we begin understand, we have to just understand something which is obvious, but just it's worth mentioning, a mushal and an imshal. When you give a metaphor, you give a mushal, you give a parable, and it's obvious that from that, we are to learn the nimshal. We are to learn the nimshal better. In other words, a mushal is introduced, a mushal is brought in order to help us, to enhance our understanding, to give us a more vivid picture, to give us a, a, an illustration of what, we're, what we need to understand. It's a, literally a, the, almost like to give us a visual of what's going on. So it's obvious so when you learn the muscle, it should help clarify, it should help enhance what is being learned rather than complicating it. If it's complicating it, then why bring the muscle? So it's and also the muscle in itself, the way that we pick the muscle, the choice of the details in the muscle, especially in Rashi, should help us and should enhance our understanding of the intricate details of the story, the intricate details of a meaning of the explanation. So when we look at this muscle, the first question that comes up is, what exactly does this muscle do? in adding and understanding, in adding insight into what Rashi explains. Imagine Rashi didn't bring the mushal. We would understand. Hashem is telling him, why are you telling me about my sons? First talk to my sons about me. What's so difficult in, 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 in that? What, why do I need a mushal for that? Okay? What, 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 uh, what's going on? What is this all about? Another thing, if you think about it, the mushal doesn't seem to be doing justice for what is the nimshal here. Because what did Moshe say to Hashem? Moshe says to Hashem, I want you, please, or he's telling him, appoint a leader. For what? For who? For the several million Jews that are there. Remember, it's not only men, it's men, women, and children. Appoint a leader, they shouldn't be without a shepherd, till now they had somebody who took care of him, who cared for them. What is Hashem responding to him? What is this mushal? Think about it, what is the mushal? The mushal is about a father and a, a woman that's dying, and a few sons. How many sons could they have already? 
So, so, so the mushal, the weight in the mushal is nothing. It, it, it's featherweight compared to the weight of what Moshe is talking about. So how the, could the mushal be helping, um, be helping anything? You know what I mean? How can it be helping us understand what's going on? Another thing. Think about Hashem telling Moshe to command the Yidin about him, meaning to not only command, but we're using the word Tzav, command, it really means to urge, right? To encourage, to emphasize. It's understood. There, there, is, there is room to really to understand that since over the 40 years, there were so many Jews who continuously doubted the power of Hashem and always found fault and always questioned and always went against, Hashem is telling him, Listen, before you talk about who's going to lead them, please talk to them about me. In other words, encourage them once again to have a muna, to bring karbonis. Karbonis is an act of a muna, an act of coming closer. Karbonis, Malashin, Kiruv, coming close to Hashem, offering. That is what I need you to do. It's understood. There is a, a, a rationale to this request. It's a, it's, it, it makes sense. It makes sense that after everything they've been through and after all the challenges that so many Yidin posed and, 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 and issues that they created against Hashem, that Hashem would want Moshe to encourage them. But how does the muscle make sense? Why would a father, especially when the wife is about to die, why would the only thing on his mind, why would he even be concerned in the first place that his sons would for some reason disrespect him, for, would belittle him, that he needs to tell his dying wife, listen, I, I need you to talk to them about me. What is going on over here? What really is this? And remember, the marshal, again, I emphasize again, the marshal was introduced not to confuse us, but to help us. And so far, there's only confusion because there's a lot of details that just don't make sense. Let's jump now to chapter 3. And here is a very interesting question. When I say interesting, because again, in Rashi, it's not only the idea that Rashi is presenting, but the way he presents it, the style, the choice of which words he uses, the choice of which words he quotes from wherever he's quoting from. Now remember, Rashi is quoting here from a Medrash. Even though this is Pshut Shemikra, but it's obvious that we need this marshal, at least it's obvious because Rashi chose to bring this marshal to help us, to enhance our understanding of Pshut Shemikra here. So, the question is, Rashi quotes a marshal. He says that he's quoting it from the Sifri, but he says the marshal is about the daughter of a king that is dying and speaking to her husband. There are several questions here. Number one, why tell us where it's from? Why tell us where it's from? If you're telling us just to tell us, hey, that's the reference, look it up there. Don't bother saying any part of the mushal. In other words, don't give us the details. This is like the mushal quoted in Sifri. And there are times when Rashi says, as explained in the Gemara, because it's not important, it's not necessary to bring the details down here. But if somebody chooses to do so, as the Rebbe refers to him, a Talmud Mamulach, an advanced student, that's the reference. Go look it up. It will enhance your understanding. But as far as the minimal necessity of Pshut Shemikra, it's enough to just say there's a reason, there's an explanation, and it's quoted there. But no, Rashi quotes partially the Mashal, and he says, he references to Sifri. Why reference to Sifri? Moreover, if you look in Sifri, if you actually look at the source, you're baffled. In Sifri, the marshal is actually presented in a slightly different manner. Or well, there are different versions, but Rashi obviously chose this version over the other ones. What are the other versions? It says, marshal for a king and his wife, meaning the queen who's dying. Here Rashi changes it. It's not a king and a queen. It's the daughter of a king and her husband. So Rashi found it necessary to change it, yet he's referencing to there, that is his source, but he changes it and somehow it's supposed to make more sense and it's supposed to enhance, again, enhance our understanding of the pshat over here, what's going on over here in this Pasuk. Now again, the 
the, the, the point over here is that this muscle is going to help us with the understanding. It's going to enhance our understanding. It's going to make everything clearer. And so far, it's just, so to speak, creating more and more confusion. Let's try to learn Ois Dalit insight. Okay, we're going a little bit insight. And then we'll continue again the other two chapters, namely uh, Hey and Vav. We'll do it orally again. Vahabir Bechalze. The explanation. And beer means the clarification in all of this. Tevas tzav, kfar pirsha rashi. The word tzav, tzav, command, that rashi is already explained. Kaniskirli, as mentioned above. The ain tzav, ela lashit and sirus. That tzav only means a lashit, an expression of encouragement, urging. Umizemuvan, and from this you understand. The haloshen tzav lo iti tochen ela leila hamis askim bepoyel bekiim atzivui shehem atzichim zirus. That typically, when you say tzav, when you say command, you're urging, you're 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 you're, you're encouraging, you're imploring that this should be done. That typically you would say it to who? To the people who are going to do it, the people who are going to implement it. Well, if he's there, and according to this, kosher because of the land. There would be actually a, a, a question in this pasuk. What is the question? What is the idea? What is the content of the parsha? What does it talk about? To offer the offerings of Hashem in each one in the proper time on each um, respective yontiv or a shchidish or the carbon tamid or whatever it is, whatever have you. Shehuda or hanasali they are koyanim. The Rebbe stresses koyanim. This is something that's done through who? Who actually implements the offerings of the carbonis? The koyanim. The kanem or tzavas bnei Yisrael. And over here it says what? Tzav. As B'nai Yisrael, speak to the Yidin. The Yidin not the ones who bring the Korbanis. True, the Yidin are part of the Korbanis. Korbanis Tamid, Korbanis Musaf, which are all being discussed here, the Yidin have a partnership in, a financial partnership in. But Lepoyal Mamish, in actuality, and that's what Sav means, do it. It's the urging that it should be implemented, it should be carried out. That's not done through B'nai Yisrael. So why does it say Tzavis B'nei Yisrael V'aloi Tzavis Adam is Banov? Or, and not, the way it should have said, command Adam and his children and his future children to call him. Or commission them in Parshat Leish Parshat Tzav. Like it says in the beginning of Parshat Tzav, exactly where Rashi says what Tzav means. Shehem HaMisas, Kibar Korbas HaKonis. They're the one, HaKorbanis, they're the one who actually are involved in offering the Korbanis. This is what bothered Rashi. This is the heading of Rashi Tzavas B'nai Yisrael. Didn't make sense. What's going on over here? Command B'nai Yisrael. Command B'nai Aroin. Command Aroin and his sons. Uletare, it's Kush Yizu. And to answer this, Kasha, mighty Rashi Tzavas B'nai Yisrael. That's why Rashi quotes in the Debra Hamaschal the word Tzavas B'nai Yisrael, Ume Farish. And he explains. Ma Omur Lemaila, what was said above? Yifkoid Hashem. Hashem should command. Hashem should direct. Gifkoid is a lotion of tzav. Command. And that's why. What does this mean? The pirush tzav is b'nei Yisrael b'nidin the don that the meaning of the word tzav is b'nei Yisrael command the yidn, which typically means again what? Just to remember to urge to to implore them to do it. But in our case, we need it not in our matter, in our subject matter here, because of this, that because it doesn't make sense that Hashem should be saying it to B'nai Yisrael, who are not the ones who offer the carbon, who love Dafkal HaKarbis HaKarbis V'yadol HaDoyres, Elezidus Kloli L'chol Yisrael HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So it becomes obvious, and this is what Rashi is explaining to us, that over here, the Tzav, does not mean what it typically means to urge them to actually do the thing. Because they cannot be the ones to be urged to do it because they're not the ones who do it. Rather, this becomes a general, a, 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 a klolos dike, like almost like a global tzav, a commandment, an urging of that general connection, that general devotion for B'nai Yisrael, the children, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Father. And this makes sense, Kemaina, as a response, 
as a reaction triggered by the words Now it makes sense it fits in. and therefore it says Lashin Sav. That's why it says the word Sav, even though it doesn't mean what it always means, urging. But why does it say Sav? But because this parsha was triggered, this parsha was said in response to what Moshe was Sav. As Hashem, Keshem Shemoshe Mitzaveni Albone, just like Moshe is commanding me, is directing me about my children. Mitzivoy, with a, an expression of commandment, he said, Yifkoid Hashem. Hashem should command. He's commanding Hashem what to do. Kachon Akadish Baruch Lamoshe, Tzave, Tzave is Boni Alai. This, in response, triggered by that, Hashem says to him, Command my children on me, about me. Tzav is Bene Yisrael. Number one. Number two. Why does it say it's Bnei Yisrael, Velo Yisar Nebonov? And Rashi is answering, why does it say, command Bnei Yisrael, when they're not the ones actually being the Korban, and not instead having said what it's supposed to say, command Aaron and his children? And here Rashi explains, Kishem Shepikas Moshe Yifkat Hashem Abbonai, just like Moshe commanded Hashem about his children, Hashem's children, but also Moshe's children, he felt like a father to them. In this, all Yidin were equal, both Koyanim and Regal Yidin, there's no difference, they were all, the, to all the children on, of Hashem, right, he's commanding him about Hashem's children. So too, in response, Hashem says to Moshe, command my children about me all my children, not just the Koyanim. It happens to be that the details that he spells out later is a carbon, is about the Korbanis. But the general response, the general reaction here was not specifically about Korbanis, but about Moshe talking to the Eden about their devotion, about their connection, their care, their honor of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Number three, Ahakach Moisif, and that's what he adds afterwards that this is not just about devotion to Hashem, you know, as some abstract care about Hashem. Rather, after the Tzav is B'nai Yisrael, then comes some detail which that happens to apply directly to the Kainim. V'amarta Aleihem say to them. Say to them what? Bring the Karbanis. That what Hashem is saying is this commandment, again, this commandment that you should not forget about me, this commandment that you should be connected to me, this commandment that you should have devotion to me and respect for Hashem should lead to the action of V'yamarta Aleihem. Umuv, and it's understood, that also the action has some connection to all the Eden, and the Rebbe says the Brennan, what is that connection? As, as understood, that because the Eden have a part in the carbon, by the Kayan in bringing the carbon, so the Eden also are the ones who are goyrem, who are causing, who are triggering a nachas ruach, a pleasure for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, so far everything makes some sense, and we understand what prompted Rashi, what triggered Rashi to explain. Now, in chapter 5 and 6, the Rebbe is going to explain the details of the Mashal and how the Mashal helped make sense of what went on over here, what's going on over here. And then we can also have a better appreciation as why Rashi quotes what he quotes in the Mashal and why he changed some of the characters, at least so it seems, from the various, from the, most of the versions in the Sifri, in the Medrash, and so on. And here it is. <clears throat> the question is, if you think about it, Moshe is talking to Hashem about what? What did he ask Hashem? What did he tell Hashem? He told him something that is a necessity. And in fact, how did Moshe say it? Moshe said it in a very harsh manner, in a manner of command. When I say harsh, I mean very strong, which in itself is a question. How does Moshe talk like that to Hashem? How does Moshe talk like that to Hashem? He should have asked. He said, please, I, I, I beg you, I ask you, can you think about them? Yifkoid Hashem! And what is, but what is he asking him? Something of importance. Something of necessity. <laughs> they should have a leader. They shouldn't be leaderless. They shouldn't just go, you know, uh, around without, some, without a head. Should have a body without a head, without a nasi. What does Hashem respond to him? 
listen, I need you to give me a nachas ruach, something which seems to be a luxury. Necessity versus luxury. Yes, Hashem wants that. That's His desire. But how does that come in response to that? I mean, it's like, imagine, you, you call for an ambulance, and he says, okay, you're calling for an ambulance, why don't you give me some ice cream? What? The, the ambulance, somebody's in danger, this is a necessity, this is a luxury, this is a want. How does one connect to the other? What, 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 what is it? What is it that connects these two? Number one, and number two, how did Moshe speak so harshly to Hashem? This is where Rashi brings in the mushal and the way he brings the mushal. Remember, Rashi said that this is a bas melech, a daughter of a king. That means her father is the king. Her grandchildren are princes because of the virtue of the fact that she's the daughter of the king. But her husband's not necessarily a king. I don't know what you call him, but her husband is her husband. She's dying. Now, a bas melech, being a princess, she has a certain personality. She has a certain character, which while she's married in normal times, would not really rear itself, would not show itself. Why not? Because typically a woman, as it says, a chumash bereshis, v'hu yim shobach, typically she gives respect to her husband. And therefore, she wouldn't tell him what to do. She wouldn't firmly direct him what to do. Or she shouldn't at least. So the daughter of the king is dying. Oh, that's already an extreme case. That's already a circumstance which calls for extreme measures. She has no choice. She needs to be very direct. She needs to be very firm. Her inner bas melech, her princess character, that firmness, that chutzpah, that strength comes out now. Moshe Rabbeinu likewise was called the Bas Melech. He's like so special to Hashem. He has that character. Never did he speak to Hashem like this. But now he's dying. Now, this is an extreme time. Extreme calls for an extreme measure. Moshe speaks his character of Bas Melech comes out. And who's she speaking to? Not to the king. This is not the story like it's brought down in the Medrash, the king and his wife speaking to the king. He speaks, she's speaking to her husband. And she's talking to her husband like a woman, a wife talks to her husband. She's talking to him about her kids. Her husband in turn says to her, one second, you're telling me about my children, about our children. Why don't you talk to our children about me? The husband realizes then in a matter of status, his children actually have something or many, many, much over him. While he's married to the Bas Melech, he has that continuous respect being the husband of the princess. They respect him. But he's not a king. He's not a king. So what happens when she dies? He's just her father. He's just, he was her husband. That, that he has nothing. If he was a king, like the Marshal and the Medrash, he has the respect, he has the honor, he has the fear of the entire nation and all the ministers and all his servants. But he's just merely one person. He's her husband. He's the father of these children. So what he's asking her is not a luxury. What he's talking to her about, to her, he's like, look, you, if I may put it in, the, in these words, you're dying anyway. I'm going to be left alone. I'm going to have nothing if you don't talk to them now. And this helps us understand what happens over here. Number one, how Moshe Rabbeinu spoke so firmly to Hashem. Number two, Hashem was not just asking him for some superfluous thing. Hashem was not asking him about, oh, I just want a little pleasure with some karbonis. Hashem is telling him, look, there's an element of the Jewish people that sadly to them, I am not a melech. All along, they were challenging me. You don't challenge a king like this. You have fear of a king. You have respect of a king. As a result, if you, when you pass away, Moshe, you're not going to actively be there. You're the Bas Melech. The wife is not going to be there to continuously encourage, encourage them and redirect them to honor Hashem, to care about Hashem. Please talk to them now. As Korboni Lachmi, my bread, so to speak. 
I need them to feed me. I need them to take care of me. But Hashem is not talking to him, so to speak, so to speak, as a king, but as the husband of the Bas Melech. Because in these people's eyes, in their behavior, it's clear that they do not see Hashem, or they didn't respect Hashem, they didn't, so to speak, their attitude towards Hashem wasn't such of a Melech, but rather of somebody of importance, but like the husband of the, of the, of the princess. And this gives us a whole clarity in what Rashi was really, really trying to tell us and how Rashi clarifies it. The fact that Rashi refers us to Safri after telling us this is because if somebody wants, like I said, that seasoned student wants to look a little deeper into this and get a much better understanding. When I say better, it's not that Rashi didn't give us a good enough understanding, but a more sophisticated one and with a deeper analysis, Fine, Rashi says there's more to this. Go look at this if free. But as far as what Rashi was looking to accomplish, everything was taken care of. Everything was done.